Hey, hey, YouTubers, it's Drew again, and tonight we're gonna have some more economics. We'll do poetry later, but tonight we're gonna do we're gonna talk about free trade, uh, immigration, and Milton Friedman, and we're gonna be helped by Frederick Douglass way back in 1871. As people should know, if they've studied their history, he wrote a lot. He wrote in a lot of magazines, and he wrote in a magazine called The New National Era. And the issue then, of course, was uh, immigration. Only this, then it was coolies, Chinese, were being imported as uh, cheap labor the way Mexicans are being imported now. So, this is perfect. Because this is a direct result of Milton Friedman's policies. Because he was a rabid free trader. So Frederick Douglass is going to... He's going to address us. Okay? So, let's begin. Let's hear from Mr. Douglass. Frederick Douglass. In the New National Era. Cheap labor, how vast and bottomless is the abyss of meanness, cruelty, and crime sometimes concealed under fair-seeming phrases. Take the one we have made the caption of this article as an illustration. Ostensibly, the demand for cheap labor is made in the interest of improvement and general civilization. It tells of increased wealth and marvelous transformations of the old and worthless into the new and valuable. It speaks of increased traveling facilities and larger commercial relations. Long lines of railway graded and meandering con canals construct splendid cities built and flourishing towns multiplied, of rich mines developed, useful metals made abundant, of capacious ships on every sea abroad, and amply cultivated fields at home. In a word, it speaks of national prosperity, greatness, and happiness. Alas! However, this is but the outside of the cup and the platter. Beautiful marble without, with its dead men's bones within. Cheap labor is a phrase that has no cheering music for the masses. Those who demand it and seek to acquire it have but little sympathy with common humanity. It's the cry of the few against the many. When we inquire who are the men that continuously vociferating for cheap labor, we find not the poor, simple, and the lowly, not the class who dig and toil for their daily bread, not the landless, feeble, and defenseless portion of society, but the rich and powerful, the crafty and scheming, those who live by the sweat of other men's faces, and who have no intention of cheapening labor by adding themselves to the laboring forces of society. It's the deceitful cry of the fortunate against the unfortunate, the idle against the industrious, the taper-fingered dandy against the hard-handed working man. Labor is a noble word, and expresses a noble idea. Cheap labor, too, seems harmless enough, sounds well to hear, and looks well upon paper. But what does it mean? Who does it bless or benefit? The answer is already more than indicated. Moments thought will show that cheap labor in the mouths of those who seek it means not cheap labor, but the opposite. It means not cheap labor, but dear labor. Not abundant labor, but scarce labor. Not more work, but more workmen. It means that condition of things in which the laborers shall be so largely in excess of the work needed to be done that the capitalist shall be able to command all the laborers he wants at prices only enough to keep the laborer above the point of starvation. It means ease and luxury to the rich, wretchedness, wretchedness and misery to the poor. The former slave owners of the South want cheap labor. They want it from Germany, from Ireland. They want it from China and Japan. They want it from anywhere in the world, but from Africa. They want to be independent of their former slaves and bring their noses to the grindstone. They are not alone in this want, nor is there a new one. The African slave trade, with all its train of horrors, was instituted and carried on to supply the opulent landholding inhabitants of this country with cheap labor. And the same lust for gain, the same love of ease, and loathing of labor, which originated that infernal traffic, discloses itself in the modern cry for cheap labor, and the fair-seeming schemes for supplying that demand. 
So rapidly does one evil succeed another, and so closely does the succeeding evil resemble one destroyed, that only a very comprehensive view can afford a basis of faith in the possibility of reform and recognition of the fact of human progress. In our paper last week, we took occasion to say a word of the coolie trade, now prosecuted in the interest of cheap labor, and as for kindred in character and results to the African slave trade of other days. Our reading on the subject since that writing shows the points of resemblance between the two schemes to be more striking than they at that time appeared, and the coolie trade but little behind its predecessor in every species of baseness and cruelty. It is now three centuries since the first recognition of the slave trade by our authority in England. It was during the reign of the great Queen Elizabeth in 1562, and it's remarkable that the great princess, while sustaining the scheme in furtherance of cheap labor, professed great abhorrence of bringing away the Africans without their consent. According to her, the Negroes came, to use a soft phrase of the American Colonization Society, to be colonized with their own consent. The same scrupulous regard for the rights of violation appears in the contracts and schemes by which coolies are transported from India, China, and other parts of the globe. What all these pretensions were worth in regard to the African slave trader, the history of that traffic as told by Thomas Clarkson and by a thousand witnesses has abundantly shown. The trade of the slave trader across the sea was a track of blood. Her wake drew into it a possession of hungry sharks to feast upon human flesh, diseased, dead, and dying. Slaves were literally stowed between decks without regard to health, comfort, or decency. Great thought of captains, owners, consignees, and others was to make the most money they could in the shortest possible time. Human nature is the same now as then. Cooley trade is giving us examples of this unchanged character. Right to the Cooley in California, Peru, Jamaica, Trinidad, and on board the vessels bearing them to these countries are scarcely more guarded than they were those of Negro slaves brought to our shores a century ago. The sufferings of these people while in transit are almost as heart-rendering as any that attended the African slave trade. For the manner of procuring coolies, for the inhumanity to which they are subjected, and of all that appertains to one feature of this new effort to supply certain parts of the world with cheap labor, we cannot do better than to refer our readers to the quiet and evidently truthful statement in another column of one of the coolies rescued from the ship Dolores Ugart, on board which ship 600 coolies perished by fire, deserted and left to their fate by captain and crew. So that was Frederick Douglass in the New National Era, August 17th, 1871. <laughs> Quite a resemblance to NAFTA and what are being done to Mexicans, huh? All right, with that, I say goodbye.